Welcome to Unlocking the Truth. This is February 20th, 2022. Today we're talking about contemporary biblical allegories. I'd like to talk today a little bit about uh, allegories in the Bible, such as Jesus's parables. And I would also like to talk about these allegories that have been brought over into contemporary modern culture. So we're going to be talking about movies today. And we're going to be talking a little bit about Jesus's parables and how to understand them. So um, I found this website. It says eight movies that contained really obvious Jesus symbolism. And those are some of the ones I want to discuss. One of the first ones, um, one of the ones I put on the Facebook advertisement for the show was about Cool Hand Luke. And as you can see in this picture, Cool Hand Luke is laid out on the table in a Jesus Christ pose, and um, his head is crowned with sunlight as it comes into the room. And I was just asking mom, I know that when I was a kid, my mom watched Cool Hand Luke all the time, or at least it was one of her favorite movies, and she had me watch it quite a few times. Uh, and I was just asking her, mom, do you remember... Um, what exactly from the story of Cool Hand Luke that might have pertained to the life of Jesus? I said, no, uh, not at all. Other than I remember there was a strong belief that he had with his mother, but he, I think he rejected Christ or religion in his everyday life. Let's see what the, what the website that I've found says about it. Says Warner Brothers, without getting to room 237, there's a hunk of Christian imagery and references all over this sweat soaked 1967 prison flick. Not only is the lead character named Luke, as in one of the apostles, but the movie goes out of its way to shoot him in a Christ like pose, such as when his head is crowned by the sun's beams and when he lays himself out on the table in a crucifixion pose. By the time Luke dies at the end of the movie, having been betrayed by Dragline, which they compared to Judas, you can consider yourself thoroughly Sunday schooled. So it might seem like a strange place for a biblical story to happen because it happens uh, in a prison yard and they're all prisoners, they're criminals. But at the same time, um, you could see that if you make the prison guards the Romans and the people who are prisoners that, uh, um, that double cross them, they could be the Pharisees. I could see how there might be some, some connections between the two stories. Mm -hmm. I would have to watch that movie again. I, it's pretty much the same with all of these movies. I almost want to go back and watch all of them to, to see the connections. Um, let's talk about E.T. I have it here, too, as you can see in the background. This was a, a George Lucas movie. He also made um, Indiana Jones. And he Spielberg. Made, is, it, is it Steven Spielberg? Yeah. Or is it George Lucas? Steven Spielberg, I think, made E.T. I know he made Indiana Jones. Yeah. Uh, I was reading about George Lucas, our... Uh, yeah, George Lucas. Uh, he, we're also going to be talking about the Ark of the Covenant and uh, Star Wars. And so, yeah, uh, Steven Spielberg and him were good buddies. I get them mixed up often. Yeah, because they each used each other's stuff in their movies. Well, apparently, I, I, there was an article that was talking about how E.T. has something to do with Jesus. Um, and I, I'm going to click this link right here. Let's just see what it says. Examining Cool Hand Luke and E.T. as Christ allegories. This is an Easter story from a website called WTOP News. It says, Cool Hand Luke. On the surface, Cool Hand Luke follows a petty criminal named Luke, Paul Newman, who is sentenced to do hard time in a chain gang in the deep south in the 1950s. But beneath the surface, it's deceptively deep it's got a deceptively deep christ allegory early on dragline george kennedy functions as john the baptist as luke stands near the water at a sink 
You don't have a name until Dragline gives you one. You'll note that Luke wears number 37 on his prison outfit, symbolizing the 37th verse in the Testament book of Luke. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Fitting Luke, fittingly, Luke performs a series of miracles for his fellow inmates, most notably the impossible feat of eating 50 eggs. Afterward, director Stuart Rosenberg uses a high angle shot to show Luke sprawled out on a table in the shape of a crucifix. After rabble rousing antics predating Andy in the Shawshank Redemption, Luke is punished by being put in a box for three days, only to climb out of a grave. Well, there you go. After the death of his mother, Luke grabs a banjo to sing Plastic Jesus, including the line, I ain't scary because I got the Virgin Mary, assuring me that I won't go to hell. Eventually, Luke's followers feed off him like the Last Supper with 12 inmates listed in the end credits to draw a direct parallel to Christ's 12 disciples. It all builds to Luke praying in the garden where he is betrayed by Dragline, Judas. As Luke stares up to the rafters of the church, if to say, why hast thou forsaken me? As Luke proclaims, what we've got here is a failure to communicate. He is shot and killed through the window. The gunman is a godlike figure whose eyes never see behind the pair of dark sunglasses, which are crushed by a car. Seeing as this is a film from the counterculture of 1967, its message may very well be anti-religion. But Luke rips up a photo of himself claiming he made it all up. But his disciples tape the photo back together in a crucifix shape across Newman's body. Either way, it proves the power of Jesus to inspire his followers who desperately want to believe in him, ending with a high angle shot of a crossroads that forms a cross. Sounds like mm. there's a lot of biblical ties there. Yeah. All right, now let's read about ET a little bit. ET stands for extraterrestrial. On the surface, Steven Spielberg's immortal childhood classic follows a young boy named Elliot who encounters an alien and helps him phone home to his ship. However, beneath the surface, it's also a deceptively deep Christ allegory. The movie opens with the spaceship appearing in the sky like a Christmas star. Elliot discovers E.T. in his backyard shed, similar to the iconic nativity stable. E.T. performs a series of miracles by levitating balls in Elliot's room, to the form the planets of the solar system and healing Elliot's body, uh, bloody finger with a divine touch. Ouch. Just as Jesus walked on water, E.T. powers Elliot's bike to fly off a cliff and soar across the moon. Uh, in an iconic shot that became the logo of Spielberg's Amblin Studio. If you're still not convinced that, of the allegory, note that E.T. eventually dies at the hands of greedy government scientists. E -I or I e Romans, only to be resurrected like just like Christ. As E.T.'s heart glows during his final goodbye, he says the line, I'll be right here, reminding us of the Christian mantra, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Finally, he ascends into the heavens on his spaceship in the final shot. Spielberg himself joked, a nice Jewish boy making movies about resurrection. That's interesting. Yeah. It kind of uh, reminds me of, you know, the Lord speaks or the Lord works in mysterious ways and he uses even the devil to get his message across uh, because, you know, obviously Spielberg is alluding to the fact that he shouldn't, he doesn't believe in Christ, but yet he's telling a story about Christ. Yeah. Not calling hmm. Spielberg the devil or anything, but. Right. So you're saying he's agnostic? I'm saying that the message seems to make itself known regardless of where it's being told. Yeah. And sometimes really good messages from come, come from the least likely sources. Well, one of those other movies I think that I saw was mentioned was 
the lion in the wardrobe? Yeah, I, I meant to, I read about that one, but I didn't include it on my list here. And I really don't know that I've watched that show all the way through from beginning to end. I mean, I liked what I saw, but I, I didn't really understand where they were going. Like it wasn't Alice in Wonderland in the, in the rabbit hole. It was another land, you know, once they went through the wardrobe. So it's about all I can tell you. I don't remember. That in, the, in the books of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, um, they always referred to basically, not in the book, but people who talk about the books refer to the lion, Aslan, as God, or maybe Jesus, depending on your interpretation. But that's, uh, that's one thing I didn't get was throughout the books, um, they're they're in a different world there's a there's different gateways all over the world that lead to um their world yeah and as as those kids in the movie as they go through some of these different gates aslan kind of comes in behind them and closes them because like whoa you, you know these gates aren't supposed to be open i'm gonna shut them down they spend a little time like in the in the books, they basically spent their entire lives, grew old there. And then when they went back to the to our world, they were young again. But in the very beginning, um, there was people being chased by the white witch. And they came into a world, there was a bunch of like puddles. And all these puddles led to different universes, different worlds. One of them led to ours. They broke a piece off of a, an old light pole. And I can't remember exactly, but they threw it in there. Threw it, and it landed in uh, that world that the movies take place in. And it grew into a lamp pole. And that's how come when they go through the wardrobe, it's uh, there's a lamp pole there. But the wardrobe was made out of a tree. I can't remember exactly how, but it, it was uh, a magical tree. It had some magic in it. And this guy cut it down, turned it into a piece of furniture, and that created a gateway those kids went through. But once they went through and came back, they were never able to go back through it. But as the book's going, in the very end, uh, those kids all get drawn back in except oh. one the older sister because at that time she was in america because it all takes place in london the yeah. uh but all those kids went through but the way it happened was uh they were in because it all kind of takes place around world war ii also and they were all in the train station or something if i remember right something happened either the train came through or a bomb or something came through and basically killed them and they woke up in the other world again and that was the final time that they were allowed to come in and they meet up with all their friends that they had in that world yeah like the little mouse and all these other people and they Characters. go to the ocean and basically the lion tells them you guys can go on go through this like wall of water but you other guys can't because basically they weren't dead yet the, some of the other characters in that world but all the yeah. earthly characters were all dead they were killed uh, and that's there was like it was basically heaven but that's the only part of that to me that struck me as kind of having a biblical reference i mean everybody uses the lion as a representation of god or jesus but through the rest of it the books and it never really struck me as that that's always when i read the books i was always confused at how people got that that it was a religious christian well am i am i wrong well i've, I've heard that c.s lewis uh intentionally put the bible references references in there and he was a religious man um but um from what I remember, when I was, tell me if I'm wrong, Robert, 
is this the same one that has something to do with the compass uh isn't there one that's called the compass is that a different story that's you're probably thinking of the golden compass yeah is that not part of the same story no that's a different story from different author it was basically around the idea that um in the world that people lived in, their souls kind of lived separately of their bodies, like externally, and lived in like an animals. That that had a lot of uh, like your your hardcore kind of church people. They hated that story. Yeah, because it was evil. Because they like had de mm -hmm. they called them demons. The animals yeah. were demons. And yeah, they and that was the, like the animals is where like that person's soul lived. Right. So they were connected to each other, but it was just that author created it where according to this, it says that that author is Philip Pullman of that story. Yeah. I've read well, that, that witch that was in there, that woman in white. What what did she represent? Good or evil? Well, on this uh Cora, uh they're asking the question, how is Narnia based on the Bible? And this woman, or a person named Zachary, says, uh, he's got five points here. He says, Aslan dies for Narnia and comes back to life just like Jesus does. And then it says, Edmund betrays Aslan in the same way Judas betrayed Christ. The white witch represents Satan and the Pharisees. Ah. His, uh, Turkish delights could be an homage to, homage to forbidden fruit. And the kids are called the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve. Mm -hmm. See, I won't try to just say what the author intended, but to me, it's like, you know, you had, he did call the, in the book, the humans were the sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. But like the white witch, she came from a different world, just like the kids did. She like came from, you had Earth over here, you had Narnia, then the White Witch came from a world over here. She, like, went through these little portals chasing somebody. But it's been almost 20 years since I read the books. Mm -hmm. So let me read what this guy says. He says, you can't explain it all on Korra. There's too much. You'd have to write a whole bunch of books about it. But he says, uh, Christ makes us king and queens in his kingdom in that we become sons and daughters of God, and he gives us victory. Uh, there is also, although the sight of water made her feel ten times thirstier than before, she didn't rush forward and drink. She stood as still as if she had been turned into stone, with her mouth wide open, and she had a very good reason. Just on the side of the stream lay the lion. It lay with its head raised and its two forepaws out in front of it, like the lions in Trafalgar Square. She knew at once that it had seen her, for it, I, its eyes looked straight into hers for a moment and then turned away, as if it were her quiet, uh, if, as if it knew her quite well and didn't think much of her. If I run away, it'll be after me in a moment, thought Jill, and if I go, I shall run straight into its mouth. Anyway, she couldn't have moved if it had tried, and she couldn't take her eyes off it. <clears throat> How long this lasted, she could not be sure. It seemed like hours, and the first became so bad that she, and the thirst became so bad that she almost felt she would not mind being eaten by the lion if only she could be sure of getting a mouthful of water. If you're thirsty, you may drink. They were the first words she had heard since scrub had spoken to her on the edge of the cliff for a second she stared here and there wondering who had spoken then the voice said again if you are thirsty come and drink and of course she remembered that scrub had said about animals talking in that other world and realized that it was a lion speaking anyway she had seen its lips move this time and the voice was not like a man's. It was deeper, wilder, and stronger, a sort of heavy golden voice. It did not make her any less frightened than she had been before. It made her frightened and rather different in a rather different way. Are you not thirsty, said the lion? I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I, could I, would you mind going away while I do so, said Jill? 
The lion answered this only back, only by a look and very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delete the delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to do anything to me I, if I do come? Said Jill. I make no promise, said the lion. Do you eat girls, she said. I have swallowed up girls and boys and women and men and kings and emperors and cities and realms, said the lion. I didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were uh, sorry, nor... If it were angry, I just said it. I dared come and drink, said. I dared not come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh, dear, said Jill. Coming another step nearer, I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. Hmm. That sounds very biblical. Yeah. C.F. Lewis, I'm, I wonder what else he wrote, because I, I don't think he wrote Peter Pan, but I think he's written some pretty popular novels, children-like. The guy said something, but he had 10 books, and I've, hmm. seen, the, I've seen the series. Let's see, C.S. Lewis book list. So uh, here's some some of the names of his books: The uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, The Screw Tape Letters, Magician's Nephew, Prince Caspian, Voyage of the Dawn Treader, A Horse and His Boy, Grief Observed, Chronicles of Narnia, Paralandria. I'm pretty sure there's a band that plays at the casino called Paralandria. <laughs> yeah, a lot of those are tied into Narnia. The Abolition of Man. Surprised by Joy. The hideous that hideous strength. He sounds like he does a lot of uh, philosophical, you know, religious type writing, just from the yeah. names of all these books. Like. Like uh, Horse and His Boy is a Narnia book. Don Treader's Narnia book. Uh, Magician and His Nephew. That one, I think, was a prequel that he wrote later. So this is a list of eight movies that also had biblical references. Uh, I'm just going to list off the list here. These are the top ones that had obvious Jesus references. Um, Anakin in Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, Aslan, The Chronicles of Narnia, Ripley in Alien 3. This is the one I want to talk about next. E.T. in E.T. As you can see, their hearts are lighting up. They're both, they both have Buddy their heart light on. That's Buddy Crash uh, Dogma. This one is. That one may not be. No, this first they do one, one where yeah. he's like, yeah, that yeah, that's one is. That one right there. Yeah, that's yeah. the dogma we talked about a couple of weeks ago. I mean, uh, yeah, like, you can go back to George Burns, uh, My God, the Devil. I think he played <laughs> God in that. Yeah, he yeah. had a cigar. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, then you got Neo in the Matrix, The Chosen One. Then we just talked about Cool Hand Luke. Uh, one that I didn't ever hear about that I thought was interesting was 12 Monkeys. Oh, yeah, that was a Brad Pitt movie. And all I remember about it being very weird. I didn't care for it. It was very weird, but what they, they talk about, basically, um, James Cole, Bruce Willis's character's name is James Cole, J.C., and he sacrifices himself to bring back the human race 
Huh. As in the movie, he keeps time jumping back and forth, going back in time, trying to save the human race from this uh, apocalypse of the 12 monkeys. Yeah, there's a virus that was released or something. Yeah, it's also interesting that I wonder if, I mean, if, if they are making a biblical reference, I wonder why they chose to make the downfall the 12, because usually, you know, the 12 is the apostles and leads to the salvation. But I guess the 12 monkeys is actually there. Well, the 12 monkeys was a terrorist group on the show, wasn't it? Yeah. But in the wasn't end, you find book? out that Bruce Willis actually brought the plague. Or no, he was a kid in the airport, I think. And he sees the guy that like opens the container in customs or something. Yeah, I remember that now. Wasn't 12 Monkeys a book though, too? I don't remember. Yeah, it says it's by a woman named Elizabeth Hand. I'm not seeing any uh, websites that pop right up referring to that as jesus other than that article that i looked up before i'll have to do more research on that uh so let's talk about alien um have you guys seen the most recent alien movies called uh, prometheus i haven't so that movie, the one the one that came out in the 80s, the original, uh, that's the one you might remember. She had a, a baby and it was an alien baby that popped out of her belly. Okay. Um, remember that with the little alien that came out of her belly? Yeah. Um, well, you know, lots of people make fun of that over the years. They'll stick their arm underneath their shirt and they'll be like, oh, this alien is coming out of my chest or whatever. Well, <laughs> Um, there were some people on these blogs that I'm reading where they're discussing that as being somehow the virgin birth. Which really? is the virgin birth, and that would make alien, the, the actual alien monster, that would make it the Jesus, right? Well, that's that to me, that's that's kind of weird. But um in the movie Prometheus, though, I, I was I was doing some research on the the latest movie that came out, and they're um, they were they the name of the the um, the original ship that they were on or the planet that they were on in that first Alien movie was called LV two twenty three, and people are saying that has to do with Leviticus two twenty three. And I looked that up and it says, say, un this is out of the King James Bible, say unto them, whosoever he be all of your seed among your generations that go unto the holy things, which the children of Israel hallow unto their Lord, having his uncleanness upon him, that soul shall be cut off from the presence. I am the Lord. So essentially what they're saying is our original origin story has been hidden from us. And if you go to Mars or wherever, whatever planet they go to, they find their place where a man was originally created, like a laboratory, like some giant laboratory. And um, in, in the, the, the movie Prometheus, these alien creatures are massive. They're big guys, kind of like we were talking about last week when we were talking about uh, the pre-Adamites, uh, possibly, you know, 60 feet tall or 15 meters tall. And um, they look uh, very alien-like, uh, but they're human beings with no hair. Let's see if I can find a picture here.
Yeah, these these creatures here are the ones that created human beings. Mm. And uh, basically, the idea is that the the story of how we were created was hidden from us. And basically, uh, it's the story of the Garden of Eden. We, they tried to be God and play God, and so they were punished and cast out. And their origin story had to be hidden, because if you knew how you were created, then you would lose your faith. And so it's a story, basically, of us being cast out of Eden to the earth as a punishment for being too, trying to be like God's. And if you actually look at, I mean, the, the reason why Ridley Scott um, used Prometheus is because if you look at the Prometheus story from uh, Greek mythology, uh, it says that uh, Prometheus created humankind from clay. And so it's nearly the exact same story from Genesis that Prometheus created them from clay and then also he um, gave them they, they, their, their punishment in the Greek mythology. Their punishment was that they were given fire. And so they were being godlike and they were being punished because they were trying to make fire and be like gods. And then another interesting uh, connection is that Prometheus had his side ripped out, just like Jesus had his side pierced with a spear. So this Prometheus character is almost like God and Jesus at the same time. Like uh, some of that story reminds me of Lord of the Rings. Have you ever read the Silmarillion? I've heard it, and I think I've heard you talk about it. Uh, yeah, it, it, I, I read it a long time ago, and it was dry and hard to get through. But it talks about um, the different gods and demigods. You had basically the head god that was creating everybody and everything. He also created like the demigods, you know, god of rivers, god of mountains, god of everything. And uh, he was creating all the people, the elves and all the other creatures, but he hadn't created man yet. And this one demigod decided they all had an image of what their, the god wanted to create. But uh, the one God that was like the God of the mountains, he was getting impatient. And so he wanted to create some men. So he creates them. And the best, you know, the image that they have isn't 100% clear. So he creates and ends up creating the dwarves. And huh. the, head the head God is all kind of pissed off about it. Like, you know, you aren't supposed to be doing this. You know, I want to create all these creatures and the way I want them to be. And this and the little demigod guy is kind of like, you know, apologetic. He's ashamed. He'll he'll just smite them right now, wipe them off, just crush them, kill them all. And the god, the head god goes, no, no, just put them away. Lock them in the mountains until I create my people. So I get done creating the men. When men are created, then you can release your doors bring them out because the dwarves were what that demigod had an image of what man was supposed to be but it wasn't clear so he kind of jumped the gun and created uh his own people <laughs> wow i looked but up some, uh, some some of the parallels from lord of the rings It says, uh, unlike Aslan in C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia, no single character fully embodies Christ figure of the story. Rather, each of these three characters clearly symbolize a different aspect of Jesus. So Gandalf, it says, has dual identities, a common man and a powerful mystical figure, accepts his leadership role and embraces his destiny disciple-like, self-sacrificial, and faithful. And then it says, Gandalf sacrifices himself for the rest of the fellowship. 
healing ability, does not question his purpose. Uh, resurrected as Gandalf the White after his sacrifice, overcomes evil, reigns in peace and righteousness, literally carried Frodo up Mount Doom in the final stages of his journey to destroy the One Ring, helping him to complete his mission and carrying his burden as he struggles to fulfill his purpose, as Jesus carried the struggling believer. And then Aragon, the healer and the glorious king. And then you have Frodo, or no, Sam Gamgee, the, suffer the suffering servant, faithful companion. So I, I think what I think what we're getting to is that basically uh, the biblical story is kind of unavoidable. Well, it's, it's the story of good and evil. Avoid it. Yeah. yeah. It's a story of good and evil. You know, a guy battles against, you know, it's like uh, Jordan Peterson had said about, you know, this. that was kind of the original story. It was the original book. You know, regardless of whether people you know, want to believe it or not, it was the original book and the first book to ever be mass produced. And the only book most people were allowed to read in Europe who could read. Here's a mention of the Cimmerillion you were just talking about. Sauron appears to, to be a depiction of evil and perhaps even a literally literary representation of Satan. He is the exact opposite of Christ-like figures of Gandalf, Aragorn, and Sam. In that he is purely self-motivated and diabolical. However, this more familiar, those more familiar with Tolkien canon and the Cimmerillion will know that another character, Morgoth, who was not present in the Lord of the Rings, who served as Sauron's master, this character is the ultimate embodiment of Satan. However, in the context of Lord of the Rings, Sauron does serve as a character most closely aligned with Satan. Mom, if you don't know who that is, that that's the guy that creates the giant eye. You remember there was a tower with a giant eye they could see everywhere? In Chronicles or? No, in Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it's like know. telling Morgoth, like embodiment of Satan. I think Morgoth was more like Hades. You know, just kind of the god of the underworld and you know, evil in general. Yeah. Um, one of the weirder things that was a little bit harder for me to follow about the Alien trilogy was they were talking about um, Shaw's character, which was uh, Sigourney Weaver's head is shaved in the first one. And uh, basically they're asking who actually created the danger for Earth. And uh, they were saying something along the lines of um, that, that Shaw actually sacrificed everyone. Uh, I'm not really sure. Let's see if I can find it. There's lots of, there's so many different theories and none of these are, are quoted from the actual author or anything like that. Uh, but let me just read a little bit of this. Did Shaw make the decision to put the ship on the planet instead of Earth to save Earth from the engineers or was the was it the engineers or even the newly created alien human hybrid race? To be honest, though, you have to think about the fact that Cameron and the writers in Aliens had a different take on the sacrifice that the Bible verse depicts. Did Cameron keep the meaning of the verse alive in the plot of Aliens in 86? To me, there is absolutely no change in the plot point if Prometheus 2 takes us back there and makes the colony on LV-426 the sacrifice. So this, when they say LV-426, they're talking about Leviticus verse 426, which reads, And he shall burn on the fat, burn all his fat upon the altar, as the fat of the sacrifice of peace offerings, and the priest shall make an atonement for him as concerning his sin. And shall be forgiven him. 
And so I think what they're talking, they're, they're trying to say the engineers are the priests and the sin could be the visitation of the planet of origin. So going back to the planet and finding out where, what their origin story was, was their original sin. And in order to save earth from being infested by these aliens, Shaw had to basically release the thing onto the ship uh and let everyone get killed so that they wouldn't re reach earth huh so that's a that's kind of a far-fetched uh connection there but uh I, it'd be interesting to find out if the author actually thought that or if this is just the dreamings of fans yeah uh next let's talk about star wars a little bit it's a little more obvious um, but I wanted to read a quote here about George Lucas. It says, uh, before he settled on a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Let me try to get this out of the way. Uh, the original Star Wars opening was explicitly biblical. It, it used to say, and in the time of greatest despair, there shall come a savior. And he shall be known as the son of the sons. And it came and it was in a book that was fictional in there called The Journey of Wills, 3127. The Journal of Wills was a kind of intergalactic holy book. The idea was that the Star Wars saga was just one story among many stories that took place in the universe and had been written down in the Journey of Wills. The Son of the Sons is a play on various names of Jesus Christ, Revelations 19:16. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Lucas used the Bible heavily for research. Denise Worrell describes Lucas's room at the time of writing. Return of the Jedi as containing a Harper's Bible Dictionary among just a few books on his desk. And as Martin Scorsese, obviously no fan of comic book films, recalls, I remember George was writing Star Wars at the time. He had all these books with him, like Isaac Asimov's Guide to the Bible. And he was envisioning this fantasy epic. It also doesn't take much imagination to see the Skywalkers as messianic figures in Phantom Menace. Anakin Skywalker's mother explains that he was the result of a virgin birth. There was no father. I carried him. I gave birth. I raised him. I can't explain what happened. Sound familiar? To, to understand the overlapping plot of Star Wars, we'll have to go into the Old Testament and into the life of King David. You might remember him from Sunday school. It's the story of the farm boy that famously refused his shield and took a one in a million shot to bring down a giant. So that's a little bit like um, the, the, the Death Star. So the Death Star is uh, Goliath. Or well, like the Empire. The whole Empire was Goliath. He was just some farm boy. But do you remember that scene where he has to fly the yeah. one ship into the Death yeah. Star? That's what I'm saying. It's like the whole, the, the, whole, the whole thing, it represents, I think the whole Empire represents like Goliath. And that one shot knocked the whole, the whole thing down. The basic plot of Star Wars 1977, as well as the story of Saul and David. A long, long time ago in the desert far, far away, a young man living a simple life in an anointed future is an anointed future leader by a wise cloak wearing sage. This king to be undergoes training, but soon shows a willful disobedience, a dark side, if you will. The wise prophet comes to regret crowning this young man, really regret it. The prophet later finds a suitable replacement for the chosen one. The, the second farm boy, the prophet discovers, is said to be the true heir. The only problem is that the first anointed king would like to see the second anointed king dead. Luke Skywalker's character arc in A New Hope, The Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi thematically cover the first half of David's life. It covers the story of the house of David, Luke versus the house of Saul, Darth Vader, 
battling for kinship and supremacy. The analogy isn't always precise. Saul and Vader both die near a place called Endor, but only the Star Wars Endor has Ewok wildlife. And as the series, and as the series uh, continued, they've moved away from the initial biblical structure. It picks back up in the new sequels from this decade with Kylo Ren in a long-haired Absalom role. Absalom, a prince, starts a rebellion that sends King David and his men into exile. He later suffers defeat in a forced battle. There are dozens of similarities and lifts from Star Wars from the above, from the Bible, that just to name a few. The name Anakin comes from the grace, the race of giants called the Anakim, Deuteronomy 2.21 and Joshua 15.14. It's fitting that Goliath, whom David kills, is thought to be descended from the Anakim. David, sparing the life of Saul in the cave of Abdullah, is mirrored with Luke hypothetically killing Vader. Luke fails a test by killing him in the cave of Dagobah. Saul's massacre of the priests is mirrored by Anakin killing the Jedi. Luke's destruction of the Death Star mirrors David's taking out Goliath with a well-aimed slingshot. The hero in both stories turns down the use of conventional weapons to rely on spiritual intuition to slay the giant. It is accomplished using a well-placed shot to one of its weak points. Both Saul and Vader die close to a location known as Endor. There is a witch of Endor in the Bible and in the Star, of, and in the Star Wars universe. The emperor's design is seemingly based on classic arts rendering of the prophet Samuel here. The ghostly apparition of Samuel, conjured up by the witch of Endor, is a kind of BC version of the hologram tech that is frequently used in Star Wars. Princess Leia is possibly taken from Saul's daughter, Michael. Like Leia, Mike, Michelle sides with the usurper farm boy against the ruling king, although it may not have been planned at the time of the writing of the first Star Wars. Leia, like Princess Michelle, is the daughter of the first bad king. Yoda is Hebrew for wisdom, and Yoda speaks the way Hebrew would sound if translated word for word. For Hebrew, particularly in the Bible, is often written verb first then either the direct object followed by the subject or vice versa. Case in point, in Luke's Jedi training, Yoda says to him, judge verb, me, object, by my size, do you, uh, do you subject? Hmm? So he says, judge me by my size, do you? Hmm? Vader has lines of Hebrew written on his breastplate. I've also seen that if you look at the pictures of the priests from the uh, holiest of holies, it looks just like Darth Vader's uh, uniform. Uh, holy, holiest of holies uniform. And I actually, this is one of the first images that I used uh, on our Facebook page. If you look at his chest right here, He's got like a golden amulet with jewels on it. Let's do a comparison to Vader. Vader's chest plate. And so, yeah, his, his chest plate looks very similar to the chest plate of the holiest of holies. Can you see him, Mom? Yeah. Pretty, pretty dang similar, huh? Yes, they are. Many of the names and cities on the original Star Wars sound biblical. This isn't the case for many of the names in the newest trilogy, which sound vaguely Irish. Such as Poe, Ray, and Finn. This Bible inspiration doesn't account for all the characters. Who is Han Solo? The closest thing might be one of david's mighty warriors 
but there really isn't anyone like him. Does this theory make Ray a kind of Solomon? Well, he was the true heir to David, and things did come easy for him, too. And I guess this would make Emperor Palpatine Satan. The analogy and the inspiration isn't complete. It almost never is. Huh. There are only so many stories in the world. In the 18th century, many years before the website TV Tropes existed, the great English writer Samuel Johnson wanted to pen an entire book to show how small a small quantity of real fiction there is in the world. And the, the same images with very little variation have served all the authors who have ever written. The Bible itself was repeated, has re repeated motifs, and there is an entire field of theology called typology devoted to studying the symbols and archetypal characters related between the Old and New Testament. A story inspiring a story is an old story. A, a story inspiring a, a story inspiring a story is as old as any story. So as millions go to see the concluding chapters of Star Wars, they will be seeing the story whose first page was written a long, long time ago in a galaxy not that far away. Hmm. Yeah, I think it goes back to you. You look at whether it's written fiction or, you know, movies now. Everybody's out of ideas. They're just repeating the same stuff. And that, that's not really? even the, the remakes of old stuff. It's yeah. like it's excruciating to watch the latest Michael Myers movie. Uh, the latest Halloween movie was yeah hard to get through for me. But like if you take you know the critics, the people, not the professional critics, but the people who just want to criticize somebody's work, like the Hunger Games, you know the people who wrote, person who wrote the Hunger Games, people criticize that as oh it was copied off of this you know, movie or this book written in Korean or Japanese. And I'm like, I doubt the author read those though. You know, because there's other movies and uh, I think it's a Japanese movie that came out before. It's about a bunch of kids who have to fight to the death. You know, like yeah. a contest or something. But it's like, none of the ideas are original anymore. They've all been done. People just tweak them as best they can to be original yeah well even some of that uh theme could be taken from uh the lord of the flies yeah those kids went nuts on that island and it was the the strongest overcame the weakest yeah, yeah it's just like um harry potter you know you've got this kid that was born and now he's going to be the chosen one to battle the evil yeah. Huh. Well, what are we going to discuss next week, Kit? It's already seven, almost seven o'clock. Uh, okay, so um, I I guess we should just keep doing the same thing. Let's watch the movies and and go, I I didn't get a chance to talk about Superman being Moses, the Man of Steel. Huh. And uh, I didn't get to talk about Pinocchio yet, which is really the bulk of what I wanted to talk about. Yeah. And also, um, I didn't get to, I wanted to also talk about parables in the Bible. So let's just make next week about Bible parables of Jesus. Well, uh, are you going to finish the allegories then? Did you say that that was part of Pinocchio and? Uh, yes. Yeah, so let's, let's just, let's just keep the same theme. Okay. Uh, but I'll also be discussing, um, the parable of the sower, sowing good seeds. Yeah. Matthew, Matthew 13. Uh, all of these verses I want to talk about are on the, on the, uh, the main page. If you click on the topic, um, okay. can you see what I'm pointing at? There's like a little down arrow here yeah. with sub so uh, we'll talk about these last two subtopics, and then we'll talk about um, uh, contemporary biblical allegories. Uh, and I, I want to talk about uh, Matthew 13, uh, the mustard seed, Matthew 13, 31, uh, John 15, the true vine. 
and Psalms 80. And also I wanted to talk about Galatians 4.21, the two covenants. Okay. So um, please just spend some time at some point this week just reading these. Uh, okay. Just these, these five or six Bible verses. And we will just discuss what you what we got out of it. Okay. What that meant to us. All right. All right. Sounds great. Have a great week. I love you guys. I'll be praying for you both. Um, be play, praying for Cody and uh, his journey in rehab. Uh, hopefully he creates a whole new life for himself and becomes renewed. I do too. And I guess the... Uh kiddos are okay i got a call from uh, their mother today just a text and wanting to know if a certain a check had come by or something you know so i think she's doing all right she just needs money like she normally does so i think we the called kids are just a little bit ago and um he uh, he is uh needing some money uh he needed 10 bucks put on his account at the bank's grove so when i get time this week i'll probably go put money on his account okay all right all right love you guys love uh, you good good luck on your biblical journey and uh hopefully we get some new nuggets i also want to look into some of the things we already talked about like the lord of the flies uh maybe i'll do a little more research on c.s lewis and and on tolkien and you know, how much of the Bible they were influenced by. Okay. Yeah, I think C.S. Lewis is more kind of Christian-based author. And yeah. T Tolkien was, uh, he was like a, a linguist and he had a lot of stuff going on in his brain. Yep. All right, well, I think we had a good episode. Uh, so let's just continue the same theme next week. Okay. Bye-bye, guys. Good. Have a good evening.